There is a question that every Christian would ask at some point of his life. I myself have asked this many times. And this is that question. Why doesn't God speak to me more clearly? Why does he always keep silent? Why is he distant? Not hearing God's voice can be very frustrating. If only God clearly spoke to us, wouldn't all our problems be easily solved? And then, is that not how he spoke in the Old Testament? Did he not speak face to face with Moses as a friend to a friend? Isn't that how he spoke to all the prophets and the kings? Why, he spoke audibly even to ungodly kings. And then what about the common Israelites? Didn't they visibly see his glory and hear his voice? So why does he choose to stay away from us and not speak to us? If God speaks audibly, there is absolutely no room for doubt. So why? Why doesn't he do so? This question is quite personal to me. During the early part of my Christian life, I struggled greatly to believe in God. I couldn't even believe in His existence. Children who have been brought up in a Christian home, who have been used to church life from a young age, they will understand what I am talking about because they would share this serious problem. You see, such people can't believe anything. So for nine years, I was begging God to speak to me audibly because I believed that only if he spoke audibly would I know that he is speaking to me. So I used to stay up at night hoping just to hear something or see something so that I could believe. I was fired up by fancy testimonies of people who said they heard God's audible voice and saw visions. And so I desperately wanted it. But then it was like chasing shadows. I could never ever reach it. Another reason why I wanted to hear God's audible voice was then I could have something to tell others about. It would be compelling evidence. And if ever one day I became a preacher, people would believe me because of my direct contact with God. But as years went by, I became more and more hopeless. 
I pleaded, God, if you're angry with me, at least scold me. I don't mind because then at least I could hear your voice. No, nothing at all. Just dead silence. I felt totally rejected by God. I reached a stage where I could walk out of church, walk out of my Christian faith, and walk away from God forever. Desperate for some sign to keep alive my dying faith, I begged him one last time. I said, God, I have come to the end. Are you not going to speak to me? Because I believe that if ever he would speak, this was that night. So I begged him for the last time and nothing happened. Absolutely nothing at all. I saw no point in seeking such a hard-hearted, merciless God. I cried bitterly and I even cursed him. I decided that I was going to walk out on God. I shook my fist at him and I got up from that act of prayer thinking, this is it. But I couldn't. I came back and I said, God, I'm not able to leave you. I beg you, please, please, please say something. Please speak to me. But he did not. But then, he did show me in different ways that he cared for me. Let me give you one incident. One day when I was in India, I remember very clearly, I became hungry and I really felt like eating a laddu. I asked some people around me, do you have a laddu? They laughed and said, no. One kind soul, seeing that I was so desperate, he said, I've got something. And he handed me something small and little colorful. I later realized it was moldy bread. I just shook my head. I turned away and I uttered a prayer. I said, God, I want a ladu and... Is this the best you can do, moldy bread? Overwhelmed with sadness and a lot of self-pity, I lay down and fell asleep. Within a few minutes, someone shook me awake and said, Brother, there is a parcel for you. I sat up and rubbed my eyes. I couldn't understand what was being said. He said, no, someone has sent this parcel for you. And it was from a totally unexpected source. So I opened it to find 15 delicious ladders. I stared in shock. I couldn't register what had just happened. I couldn't process my thoughts correctly. My emotions were somersaulting inside me. And then I just cried because at that moment I knew he cared for me. Now this happened a few times so I was convinced that God cared for me. But then he still would not speak audibly to me. Maybe some of you are in a similar struggle and that's why you're asking this question. Why doesn't God speak audibly to me? So let me briefly give you an explanation why God doesn't speak audibly today like he used to speak in the Old Testament. Let me begin with 
an illustration. The Concord was the first and one of the greatest supersonic passenger carrying commercial airplanes ever designed and built. It was built jointly by British and French manufacturers. It entered regular service in 1976. The Concorde could fly at twice the speed of sound. Imagine that! Such an amazing aircraft indeed. So, the obvious question is, why don't they have Concords anymore? Why did it stop flying? Simple answer, because it failed. In July 2000, a Concorde Air France flight crashed, killing 113 people. That was the beginning of the end. So factors like safety concerns, less public demand, too much noise were some of the reasons that in 2003 the Concorde stopped flying. Now this is an invaluable lesson from history. Because like the Concorde, there are things that seem appealing to us. But we learn a great lesson when they fail. Now, imagine a system where you are able to listen to the audible voice of God every day, guiding you clearly. That system describes the Old Testament. The Old Testament was that ideal world where God spoke audibly and appeared visibly and related to his people tangibly. He was not a weak and a silent God. He was mightily active. He fought their battles. He supplied their needs. He clearly counseled them. There was nothing fuzzy or unclear about how he led his people. He led them with pillars of cloud and fire and through prophets who clearly heard his voice. And God was just in all his dealings. Every sin was punished. Every good deed was commended. This is how that system was. And what was the result? Instead of becoming the dream generation of perfect people, the Israelites became the most rebellious people. They constantly broke God's laws and went after idols. Then God shut down the system and he went into silence. He gave up his people to their enemies, but then they repented and turned back to him. And in his great compassion, he forgave them and restored the system. And what happened? They went right back. Now, this happened over and over and over. You go and read the history. Read the Psalms. There is clear evidence that this system, which seemed almost perfect and foolproof, was just another concord. Its success rate was zero. Think of the time when the Israelites were standing at the foot of Mount Sinai. Just imagine that scene in your head. Moses led them all the way and they are all standing there at the foot of the mountain. And then God descended in all his glory on the top of the mount. What a fearful sight that must have been. There were loud claps of thunder and flashes of lightning, dark clouds and smoke surrounded the peak. Let me read it to you directly from the Bible. Maybe then you will believe it. Here it is, Exodus chapter 19, verse 18 and 19. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, 
and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And again later, we read, And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. The Israelites trembled at this awesome display, a visible display of God's presence. They did not have any doubt. They knew this was God. But what happened? Instead of having the desired impact, it had an adverse and negative effect on the faith of God's people. My dear friend, you want God to speak clearly to you, to make everything clear to you. You want clear answers, clear guidance, a clear pathway for your future, a clear voice speaking so that there is no room for doubt. Your desire is sincere. But there is an important lesson you must learn from history. The Israelites had it exactly as you want. Everything was clear to them in the wilderness. They saw the glory of God. They heard his voice. They saw the miracles of God one after the other. There was absolutely no way to doubt God. Just imagine the testimony of random Israelites after they came out of Egypt. They had seen those spectacular sights and awesome miracles, the kind of life that we dream of. They saw the rod turn into a serpent. They saw water turn to blood. They saw the Red Sea divided by the power of God. They saw the Egyptians drown in that same sea. They saw water miraculously gushing from a rock. They saw bitter water turn sweet. Wow! But then what happened? Even before Moses could descend from the Mount Sinai, they were dancing half naked around a golden calf. So what was the use of all those miracles? It did nothing to them. There was no spiritual growth at all. This was just another concord. The Israelites saw the glory on the face of Moses. Did it bring joy or increased faith? No, it created fear and panic. They wanted to hide from that glory. The audible, visible, tangible method of guidance had a diminishing effect, a stunting effect on their faith. My friend, think about this. Why do you have to pursue God when everything is so clear? Why do you need faith if God has guaranteed and shown you the results? Why do you need to pray any more at all? Why trust Him? Then think later of that mighty showdown on Mount Carmel when Elijah was prophet. The prophets of Baal gathered together on the top of the mount, and then when Elijah prayed, a massive fireball fell from the sky. That one incident has inspired so many songs. We sing, Lord, send some more Elijahs to pray the fire down. We sing that beautiful hymn, Let the Fire Fall. And then a more modern hymn, Send the Fire Today. It was an awesome event, yet it had no lasting effect on the children of Israel. Now just imagine this. What if such a mountaintop glorious event happened in the New Testament? Well, you don't have to imagine. It actually did. Think of what happened on the top of the Mount of Transfiguration in the New Testament. It's recorded in Matthew 17. The disciples saw Jesus 
in the brightness of his glory, so bright it was like the sun shining in, it, in all its glory. And then they saw Moses and Elijah. And a few verses later, I'm reading from the Bible, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Listen to him. So the disciples saw Jesus in his glory and they heard the voice of God the Father speaking audibly. What was the effect on the disciples? Did they rejoice or bow down and worship? No, in verse 6 we read that the disciples were terrified and fell face down on the ground. What are we learning from all this. The Old Testament was that perfect, open system that you are longing for. The system where the Israelites did not need any proof of God's existence. His voice was audible. His appearance was visible. His presence was tangible. His will was intelligible. And yet they remained incorrigible. True, there was no room for doubt in that system. And yet, God's open and direct way of dealing with them produced the very opposite effect than what was expected. One man said it this way, When there is no longer opportunity to doubt, then there is no longer opportunity for faith either. That is why even in the Old Testament, God withheld himself from his saints in order to build up faith in them. Job is an obvious example. We read that book of Job, we, we know the whole story and how God spoke to him. But do you realize that God spoke to him only at the end of the book? All through his distress, Job was asking God to speak to him. And finally, in chapter 23, Job records how he felt. This is what he says. If I go to the east, he's not there. If I go to the west, I do not find him. When he's at work in the north, I do not see him. And when he turns to the south, I catch no glimpse of him. Listen to the psalmists as they struggle with the same feeling that God is not responding to their cries. Psalm 10.1 Why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Psalm 13, 1. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Psalm 44, 24. Why do you hide your face and forget our misery and oppression? I know some of you are hurting and struggling and you still want to hear God speaking audibly at least once. All right, let me ask you. Just imagine you heard a loud voice one day. My son, you must fast and seek me for 10 days. I ask you, how would you know it is God? Yes, you heard an audible voice. What if someone was playing a trick on you? Maybe with a hidden speaker or something? Or what if it was not God, but the devil? Because I've heard great saints say how they heard God's audible voice commanding them to do something, only to realize later that it was not God, but the devil. 
And so they warn people about listening to an audible voice. And let me add a footnote to that. Because today, there are preachers and revivalists who keep saying, God told me this and God said that. and They seem to be hearing an audible voice and God seems to be relating to them in a very different way. I would be very, very cautious about it. Because the Christian world has changed. The latest trend is people claiming that they are having divine encounters. They call themselves prophets who are walking with God. And they say so many things that are contradictory to the word of God. Now this is not new. Such things happen in the Bible too. Let me read to you from Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 14. Then the Lord said, These prophets are telling lies in my name. I did not send them or tell them to speak. I did not give them any messages. They prophesy of visions and revelations they have never seen or heard. They speak foolishness made up in their own lying hearts. I'm now drawing to a close, but I think some of you might be a bit disappointed. Am I saying that God would never speak to you? Oh no, He will. And that is the good news I want to end with. The good news is that God actually speaks. But the trouble is that because you're so obsessed with hearing an audible voice that you have missed Amazing opportunities that have been right in front of you. Let me explain. Today, we communicate through various media. People text one another or send emails to one another. Now, say when someone texts you, what do you say? You say, this person told me. Say, so someone has texted you saying, please meet me at this place at 10 a.m. tomorrow. That's the text. So what do you tell others? I have to meet this person at 10 a.m. tomorrow. He told me. Did he tell you? Did you actually see him? No. All he did was send you a text, but that text is as sure to you as his voice. Because today, texting is the same as talking. So let me put it this way. God texts us through his word. The Bible is God's text message to us. The Bible is the primary way that God speaks to us today. When we want to hear God's voice, the Bible is where we should look. Most of the will of God for our lives is already fully revealed in its pages. The Holy Spirit will direct you to the right passage to guide you in a particular situation. Think about what I'm going to say. The disciples lived with Jesus, that is God himself, for three years. They ate with him, they walked with him, they ministered with him, and at the end of the day, they even lay down and slept together. Got up the next day, they were living with Jesus, walking with Jesus. They saw his miracles, they heard his messages, but they did not grow spiritually at all. But after Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came into them, he began to lead them differently. Now this God who was with them, he was now inside them. And they began to grow profoundly in faith. Now, I told you at the beginning, for nine years, I was desperate to hear an audible 
voice. I wanted to hear the voice of God. But when I understood all this, I became excited. My prayer changed. I said, God, speak to me any way you desire to speak. But let me know what you're saying and let me be sure about your will and help me obey you. Friend, it requires a bit of humility to be willing to submit to God's method of communication. But then think about it. When the old system failed, this new system is specially designed by God himself. It is a system that will not fail because it is the Holy Spirit who guides us into this experience. When God speaks like this to you, you will be fully convinced that it is God. It will be as sure as receiving a text from God himself. And that is why God's word has its own voice. Did you know that? The word of God has a voice. And that's why we read in the Bible how people heard the voice of his word. So many have testified about the Bible and they say, this book has a voice. It's speaking to me so clearly. My friend, you are missing something. The Bible may be in text form, but God will speak to you through this so clearly that there will be an explosion within your heart. You will know that God himself is directing you and I guarantee that it will be far more satisfying and clear and long-lasting than an audible voice. And one more thing. This system is safe because it is God's word. When the Great Reformation took place under Martin Luther, the first thing he said is, stay within the parameters of God's word. Don't go outside. Stay within the word of God because that is safe. Churches that begin to teach things that are not in the word of God, they will go astray. But if you stay within the word, that word will never mislead you. We can trust God's word more than any prophet's voice. My friend, it is in this foolproof system that you learn to live by faith. Because everything is not so clear, you have to learn to walk by faith. And that, my friend, is how the saints made it to the end. How lovely it is to know that you are going to be one of them. Amen.